Welcome to Diamond Webinars. We'd originally planned to present on the State of Accessibility Report today, but in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've changed the content format and invited guest panelists from the digital accessibility community to join in a conversation about handling this crisis with respect to people with disabilities. I'm Jonathan DeArmas, a partner here at Diamond. Diamond is a digital agency built by developers with a commitment to well-crafted, inclusive software built on best practices. We support media companies and large brand names who rely on us every day for product strategy, experience design, and full stack development services. Diamond proudly sponsors Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Founded in 2012 and occurring on the third Thursday each May, the purpose of GAD is to get everybody talking, thinking, and learning about digital accessibility, access, inclusion for people with different disabilities. GAD has turned into a global event with the Twitter reach of 195 million people on the GAD hashtag and celebrated by companies large and small. Diamond has launched our accessibility practice to marry our love of building great software with our commitment to the accessibility community. We offer assessments, audits, and general consulting, but also the hands-on development for remediation efforts. Of course, any Greenfield project is built with A11Y accessibility in its DNA. With all that in mind, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event. I've had the honor of walking with this man on the red carpet a few times. He's been a tech community builder in the LA area for over 15 years. In 2012, he co-founded both GAD and Diamond. Welcome, Mr. Joe Devon. Joe, take it away. Thank you, Jonathan. Before I do the intros, I'd like you all to know we're gonna do about a 20 minute panel and then open things up to the audience for Q&A. And Sherry may have to leave after 30 minutes, so we will be mindful of that. For the introductions, we have Sherry Bernhaber, who is the head of accessibility at VMware and a member of the IAAP Global Leadership Council. She's a leading expert in the accessibility and disability field in both education and business. She's known for launching digital accessibility programs at Fortune 200 companies such as McDonald's and Albertsons and is currently running the accessibility initiative at VMware. And on the side, Sherry, I don't know how you do this, somehow, almost on a daily basis, you write an incredible, awesome article about accessibility, really high quality and, and quite prolific. I'm, I'm pretty jealous of that. Twice a Second, week. Twice a week? Okay. Twice a week, I, I, not, every, not every day. Don't make me out to be something that I'm... <laughs> It's still, it's still pretty impressive, and, and it feels to me like it just comes one after the other, so I thank you for it. Second up, we have Ted Drake, who is an experienced engineer, developer evangelist, and accessibility expert who leads the accessibility efforts for Intuit's desktop web and mobile products. He co-founded Intuit's Special Needs and Abilities Network for Employees and promotes Intuit's diversity and hiring programs. Prior to Intuit, Ted co-founded the Yahoo Accessibility Lab and worked on some of Yahoo's largest websites, and he is a big leader in the accessibility community. Last but certainly not least is John Herzog, who is a lead accessibility solutions engineer at AT&T's Corporate Accessibility Technology Office. He previously, which is amazing because he's a friend of mine and we've done a, a fair bit of CDAA work, previously he was an attorney at the FCC where he drafted the new accessibility regulations for TV and internet providers known as the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, otherwise known as CVAA. And now he does a lot of work together with DirecTV to make sure that their solutions are accessible. So I would like to start with a personal question. We have some craziness going on right now, and I'd like to know, how are you all doing? Why don't we start with Sherry? Okay. I am doing fairly well under the circumstances. In addition to being a wheelchair user, I also have several autoimmune issues, and so that's been interesting. I've stopped taking all my immune suppression medication. That's not fun, but you know, the rest of it is, is going fine. I'm lucky that I live on a farm. I'm wishing I'd gotten a cow last fall, but other than that, pretty good. Good. John, how about you? Thanks, Joe, for asking. I'm doing relatively well. My situation is a little different from Sherry's. I, I live in the suburbs of Los Angeles, but I'm taking some safety precautions. I am a, a blind individual and I don't drive. And um, although rideshare services are still working and grocery delivery is still working, 
I'm actually choosing to go home to Chicago to be with family in the event that they make tighter travel restrictions. Uh, because if they do that, my concern is that the uh, delivery services would stop, the rideshare would stop, and groceries would be very hard to come by. So I'm a little concerned. I'm changing my daily routine as a choice, but you know, for right now, uh, everything is going well, and uh, I'm asymptomatic, which is great. <laughs> yeah, thank God. <laughs> thank you, John and Ted. So far, everything's going pretty well for me. I've been focusing more on other people how I can help them out. It seems like now that I'm working from home, I'm working 20 hours a day instead of only 10. <laughs> you need to get some sleep. So as a nation, somebody told me this line, which I thought was really apt. He said that as a nation, we're going through an organizational accessibility stress test right now. As John can attest, I guess as everybody can attest. So now if you are in charge of communications for an organization, what do you think might be missed in order to be inclusive to people with disabilities? And this is an open question. So I think I, accessible I can, communications are clearly an issue. I saw uh, PDF files yesterday released by San Diego County and, and Georgia Division of Public Health and even the World Health Organization where they were, you know, untagged PDF files wow. with graphics with no alt text. And I think in the rush to get out information, the people with disabilities are being left behind. And this is not something new. People with disabilities are always likely to fare more poorly in natural disaster types of situations. We had all kinds of problems with PG&E during the power system shutoffs last summer. And captioning is really important. You know, you may have somebody who has unilateral hearing loss and can get by in a face-to-face -face setting. But if they're totally isolated and working at home and maybe can't speech read the whole time, you know, they, their comprehension might go off a cliff. So I think it's Im important to be thinking about that as well. You know, Sherry, just to add and echo what you said, one other potential problem is that um, companies are starting to put together web portals with the latest COVID-19 information. And of course, because they're rushing to put the portals out, they may not have tested for things like keyboard accessibility, screen reader accessibility. So in some cases, you may even have trouble getting to the unlabeled PDF file in the first place. I, I smile. I don't mean to make light of the situation, but... Uh, you know, that, that is another concern as well. Yeah, I, I tell people, for God's sakes, just use a WordPress accessible template and worry about making it pretty later. You know, branding should be taking a second seat to accessibility today, not the other way around. This is Ted. I'm working with a colleague. Uh, she's deaf. And as we're moving more and more of our presentations and meetings to blue jeans and Zoom, we're coming across the problem of where where can she use VRS, video relay service? Where do we use video remote interpreting? Where do we use live captioning? Hasn't been as much of a problem in the past, but you can't use VRS if the meeting is more of a presentation. It's got to be a uh, two-way dialogue in order for it to be used. John, you might have more information on that since you're from the FCC originally, but so we're, we're trying to figure out, we're doing a lot of transcripts for meetings that sh this would also affect our, we have other people that work with in, in our extended team that have their hard of hearing or have communication disabilities. I was really uh, pleased to see a new release of MS Teams come out a couple weeks ago before everything hit the fan. And I found that their accuracy rate for automatic captioning is vastly improved, called auto captions for a reason, because you don't identify who's the speaker. But Microsoft has actually gotten it to the point where it's almost uh, usable with those two caveats in mind. So if nothing else, use MS Teams, because that you'll always have available. You don't have to worry about well, do I have, you know, 75 bucks an hour to pay the, the live captioner or, you know, anything else related to cost? It's, it's just flip a button and it's on. The other suggestion I might have is depending on what chat software your business uses, sometimes you can have team chat rooms and, it, you know, it might be useful to conduct meetings that way so that everybody is typing and that allows somebody with a hearing disability to be able to read and make sure that they understand what's being said in real time, as well as communicate in real time. 
you know, I know that it's tough because you have people typing over each other and it's not perfect, but that might also be a, a short-term alternative as well. Our team uses Slack for communication. So Slack for the win, it's, it's really accessible and, and it's a great way. In fact, we have a Slack channel just for our team called, you know, teamwork from home where we post pictures of our lunch and, you know, pictures of our pets that you normally talk about on a day-to-day -day basis in the office instead of eating lunch together. So yeah, I, I'm definitely yeah. a big believer in Slack. Yeah, I actually invited um, their head of accessibility to this one, and he only got back to me this morning that, that he couldn't, that he didn't catch my request. So we may get him in the future because it's certainly going to be interesting to make sure that Slack is fully accessible and nobody's having trouble. And I'd also like to do a shout out to the LA city. All the TV, at least, that I've seen coming out of there, they always have someone doing sign language right next to the speaker. So there are some folks definitely getting it right, which is, which is really good. Now I have a question for you, Sherry. You wrote an article about online education with respect to inclusiveness. A lot of folks are, have to obviously take their classes online with all the schools closed. What particular challenges do you think online educators face and what kind of tips would you have for them as they are switching to online version? Thanks, Joe. So before I became a digital accessibility professional, I, I did do a lot of IEPs or individualized education plans with a primary focus on children who are deaf and children with autism. I think I did 200 of them, not counting the ones that I did for my own child. And I think the biggest problem is that the teachers aren't getting great direction from the administrators in the school setting, and the teachers don't really have budget to spend $1.25 a minute for Rev.com for transcripts when it seems perfectly reasonable for a corporation to pick up the cost for that. And captioning manually is really painful and really time-consuming. I think the best thing that teachers can do is, you know, talk to the parents of the kids that are struggling and maybe they're struggling, you know, if you have an IEP or a 504 plan already in place, you know, continue to follow that plan to the, to the best of your abilities, but you're going to have kids fall through the gaps. And those are the kids that were, you know, like the person with maybe unilateral hearing loss in the classroom setting, they were okay, but in an online setting, not so much. So again, using MS Teams, which everybody, you know, largely has available to them. There's a couple of, there was a, a, a captioning system for, just for teachers, for, for classroom lectures that I saw that's being made available for free now during the crisis. I'm spacing on the name of it, but if somebody wants to know, if they can, you know, I'll dig it out of my archives. Making sure that the, you know, graphics have appropriate descriptions making sure that you're checking in on the kids' mental health. Obviously, that's going to be really important as well. You're going to have children who are going to be doing more poorly because they react to change, and that's typically going to be your children on the autism spectrum, uh, but you're also going to have children who just don't do well with the isolation in general, and a lot of that is going to depend on, on their family settings and what they going on. I think the teachers need to ask the right questions, but then parents also need to demand from the schools, you know, I want to reopen my IEP for this particular situation and make sure that their kids are getting the appropriate support. Thanks. Yeah, it feels like communication is really important, both from the parents to reach out to students that they, they feel might be having some kind of issues and, and check in on them proactively, because sometimes some families may not feel comfortable bothering teachers, especially during this time. But at the same time, parents should not be shy about reaching out to the teachers. I, I think that's some great advice. Exactly. And putting my litigator hat on for a second, if you're going to ask for extended services later on as a result of not getting what your kid needs now, you have to ask what they need to not get it. So right. the parents can't expect to be able to say in six months, I need special services, you know, extended services as if you didn't ask for them during the time when it was happening. Right. Yeah, makes sense. So John, you wrote the CVA, as we mentioned, and if I were you, I'd probably feel really good right now having done that because it covers things like closed captions for live TV, as well as for OTT platforms. And it really matters when all these, these emergency messages are going out. Do you feel like 
the the law is comprehensive enough the way that it was passed or do you feel like there might be other disabilities that might be missing or other aspects of the law that could be improved what a great question joe so the answer is both the cvaa seems to provide a lot of support in some ways to individuals with disabilities and in other ways i'm still concerned about a number of things the fact of the matter is for live tv if a user has a cable or satellite subscription that's pretty straightforward you know the rules say that you have to have captions for any live content and you have to have captions for emergency information. So that would be like any real-time updates that give the community information about where to go and what to do and you know what the new restrictions are. And so if somebody, for example, who is deaf, doesn't see those captions, they could easily let the FCC know, the FCC would let the TV service provider know, and then they would correct the problem. They would negotiate with the network that broadcasts the, the feed and, and correct the problem. Similarly, if someone is blind and they have the, the CVAA says that the emergency information has to be made available through a secondary audio stream. So again, if you're a cable or satellite provider, the path is pretty straightforward. If you have a problem, you can go directly to the FCC and they will then open up an inquiry and they will talk with you and, and the network and figure out exactly what went wrong. What concerns me though is when we get to over-the-top video services because some of these services they're aimed toward cord cutters and they don't they're not necessarily part of a traditional cable or satellite subscription and what concerns me there is those services that are uh, streaming content specifically over the internet they might be using national feeds of, of network stations rather than local feeds and that's a problem for every user not just users with disabilities but also I've heard the argument before that some of these services are making that they don't count as an MVPD, but they don't count as a cable or satellite provider. So therefore, the, the requirement to caption in emergency information or you know, provide secondary audio doesn't necessarily apply to them. And so what concerns me then is that a user who is using a cord cutting service, for example, while they might see captions for pre-recorded content, it's not exactly as clear what the process is if they're missing captions or audio descriptions for live emergency events. Because number one, these cord cutting services may not even provide that. And number two, if they do, the question then becomes, well, they're not, you know, they're not broadcasting TV over their own proprietary closed networks, which is one of the key parts of the definition of a cable or satellite provider. They're just streaming it over the internet. So I'm, I'm very concerned to see how the FCC would, would react to claims from users if they don't see or hear the emergency information. Another thing, Joe, it's worth mentioning here is that, you know, the CBAA does a very, very good job of mandating that information on television receives captions. But my concern is that I've seen some newsletters and things and some bulletins go out that, that companies may share with their employees. And they may have links to YouTube videos that are auto captioned. And we've touched on that before. Or they might have in-house produced videos that are produced without captions or without sufficiently describing what's going on on the screen for users who might be blind. In terms of whether or not we're missing any groups of people with disabilities. My, my thought, my first thought when you ask that question goes to users with learning disabilities and cognitive impairments, because oftentimes the jargon and the words that are used are written at an eighth grade reading level, which is fine, but sometimes you might need to convey the information visually, for example, as opposed to a wall of text or you might need to make it a little bit more uh, easy to understand the exact steps you're asking the person to perform. It's actually a good user experience practice to convey information in multiple ways, visually, audio, textual, since different people process information differently. Correct, yeah. So now I'm gonna ask you a question, Ted. The two of us had, had spoken recently at a conference to each other. You, you had conveyed that there is a 3D printing effort, I think it was like a hackathon, related to printing devices that would be helpful for people with disabilities. And now 3D printing is having a moment uh, because there's this company in Italy that figured out how to 3D print 
valves for ventilators, which is pretty much everybody knows there's not enough of now. I actually took that as inspiration and got some friends to start working on some webinars to try and crowdsource 3D printing the valves and, what, and other things that might be needed. What do you feel we can do beyond what's being done now with respect to people with disabilities? Intuit has been a sponsor of the Wetborough Conference, which is a conference for research. And there's been a number of papers that were written about 3D printing. There was a, a really good one from Stony Brook University where they created a stand that basically you put your, your iPhone into it, actually like this, and it sends out, uses the camera to look at a form. So a person that was blind would actually be able to write their signature on a piece of paper because the phone would be able to identify the signature block on a check or something like that. And that's an example of something that could be 3D printed in mass by people around the world. There was another research paper that looked at Thingiverse. And Thingiverse is an open contribution platform for basically like recipes to 3D print stuff. What they found was that there's a lot of recipes for assistive technology, but most of them fall into the camp of this looks cool, but it doesn't actually work. So what would be helpful is an organization like the Lighthouse or the Center for Independent Living to curate maybe a weekly or a monthly project that people around the country or around the globe could print and then ship them to their local nonprofit it could be a, a device that helps people open uh, doors. I've seen things that hold a key so that you can open up a, a door with a key and you don't have to touch the small key. You've got like a big thing to hold. It could be something like that phone stand. It's just an opportunity that we can use the downtime that people have around the world. Is there a URL that you can share about that? I can share uh, some of the research papers and also Thingiverse. I have a link. Uh, that I can share with you on how to search for accessibility elements within Thingiverse. So I'm going to ask the final question. We Sherry had to drop, unfortunately. I'm going to ask the final question for both of you. But as I'm doing that, folks that, are, that have joined the attendees, if you click on the Q&A button down below, start to ask some questions, which we will go to as, as we finalize this panel. So I was reading a report on the psychological effects of being stuck indoors and let alone the stress of, of going through a pandemic. There's a lot of people concerned about depression and people being suicidal. So can you speak to what we can do to mitigate these effects and how it impacts people with disabilities? I can start if you don't mind. We have a colleague at Intuit who has a child with uh, autism and he just wrote a really good article medium about uh, raising a child with special needs during the pandemic. And some of the key takeaways is that his child had a support system of nurses and caretakers, teachers, and they've all been taken away from him for one reason or another. Not only that, but the places he liked to go, the zoo, the park, the mall, he's not able to go to those places. So he said one of the difficulties with a child that's on the spectrum is that sudden changes and disruptions to normal schedules is difficult. So he's been working on how to explain to his son why they can't go to the zoo. I'll share the link later on. The other thing is we've started a series of lunch and learns at work. So it's a virtual seminars every day from 12 to 1. And one of them leads one of our local employee networks for uh, disabilities. She's talking about sobriety in the workplace and uh, mental health. And a lot of people that are in recovery depend on face-to-face -face communications, the support circles, going to meetings. And a lot of those meetings have been canceled because they're in churches or they're in storefronts or they're in you know elk lodges or places like that. So there's a need for how do you fill in the gaps for people that are in recovery. I did find an article on online meeting spaces that are trying to be used for recovery. You know, it's interesting, Ted, you, you talked about people relying on others and, and relying on face-to-face. -face. And what I, the, the thing I immediately thought of are 
people who might utilize personal care attendants for one reason or another. Uh, there are people with substantial physical disabilities who might rely on somebody to help with cooking or cleaning or other household errands and things. And of course, if you have this whole social distancing phenomenon occurring, then what happens when people with disabilities might lose their care attendance? You know, in, in some cases, I, I'm not trying to exaggerate or use hyperbole here, but it could be a matter of life and death. Because if you're not really able to do those things for yourself, and yet obviously we need them, what are you going to do when people start to distance themselves or they may not feel comfortable exposing themselves to another person and, and going over uh, amidst the coronavirus risk? You know, we, I talked about this a little bit, but the same is true even for transportation. You know, you're either at an extremely high risk by taking public transit or taking Lyft and Uber, but if those services stop running at some point, that also leaves the people with disabilities at a disadvantage because anybody who can't drive, even the elderly, they're now looking at being completely shut into their houses as opposed to the rest of the demographics who are able to go out and go to parks at least, if you know, go and, and take walks around the neighborhood at least, uh, those sorts of things. So it's, it's really a, a complex issue. That's for sure. All right, uh, I'm gonna go to Q&A. So we've got, let's see, Courtney Taniguchi asks, are you aware of any research reports or ethnographic studies looking at how users use OTT apps for various accessibility needs? I've been very keen on conducting this sort of research, but would be great to know if anything like this already exists. Sorry for the acronym, what does OTT mean? OTT means over the top. It means things that you basically install on your own device uh, as a user, things that you would utilize that are not included or maybe not even originally intended for the functionality of the device. Like Hulu, Netflix, those would be OTT apps. I, I don't know the answer to the question about ethnographic studies. Do you, John? I, I think it depends on the disability type. So, you know, the, the question that's being asked is rather broad, and I can point you to a few resources. I'll have to do it after the meeting, but I can point you to a few resources for people who have visual impairments. I know this personally from uh, experience. There's also an effort going on by Microsoft, which is the Accessibility Research Center, where they conduct polls uh, and surveys of users with different disabilities. But the problem there is that it's a self-selecting survey. So in other words, it relies on the people to say, yes, I'd like to be a part of this, as opposed to conducting uh, real world research about what the real demographics are, as opposed to the self-selecting. I, I would suggest for Courtney, I would suggest that you get a, a better idea of exactly which disabilities you might be particularly interested in. And then we might be able to help you a little bit more with a little bit greater specificity. Um, and that's, I'm not trying to get out of answering the question, but it's just, there, there's so many different things. My colleague, she submitted a paper for CSUN on the intersection between accessibility and socioeconomic factors. Thanks, Ted. Now we got a question from Sagar Barbaya, and I hope that I got your last name right, Sagar. Do we have stats of how many CEOs are working on bringing initiatives to support underprivileged people during this COVID-19 crisis? I don't know, unfortunately. It's a great question. I don't know. I think there's a lot of CEOs that are sending out statements about how the companies are reacting, but I don't know how many companies are directly able to impact people that are affected by this. I know that at Intuit, we've created websites for small business taxpayers and accountants to file their taxes on time and support their clients that need accounting help. And as a small business provider, a supporter, I mean, we're, we're also looking at how we, can, how we can surface more information for small businesses, but that's not necessarily for low-income families. Thanks. All right, I am going to end with one more. What are some things that people normally don't do but can do in their everyday lives to help others who rely on accessibility services? You know, Joe, I've seen this floating on social media, and it's the concept of helping your neighbor. You know, one of the things that would be the most helpful 
is if you know somebody in your social circle or at your work circle and you're relatively close to them from a geographic perspective, ask them if there's something that you can do to help them out. You know, ask them if you can grab some groceries for them. Ask them if you can assist them in some way. I mean, I think that's a good thing to do normally, but I think it could be more vital to people who have physical disabilities and for whom traveling is made much tougher by this coronavirus. And similarly, allow people with disabilities to help you. Obviously, nobody wants to feel like a charity case. Nobody wants to feel like a third wheel or like a burden. So, you know, certainly allow them to to help and be helped. But the sense of community is what I would say is one of the most vital things and, and really looking out for each other and seeing and asking questions. You know, a lot of people are kind of afraid when it comes to people with disabilities. They're kind of afraid to ask questions because they don't want to ask it the wrong way. They don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't want to do the wrong thing. And I, I would suggest being perhaps a little bit less reserved in these times because if you don't ask, you never know. Charles Hall says, oh my God, thank you for saying that, John. Allow people with disabilities to help you. So that was a big shout out there. Nice. I'll say, don't call him up and say, hey, can I, do you need anything? Or, hey, how are you feeling? But saying, hey, Nick, can I come over and do your laundry? You know, have like concrete actions that you can do. The other thing is also pay attention to people that don't necessarily consider themselves to have a disability. And I'm thinking about people over 60, 70, 80, people that may not think that they need help. Also think about people that don't consider themselves to have a disability, such as people that are aging and ask them if they need help, volunteer to bring them groceries. There's a lot of people out there that, that need help but don't necessarily have the support systems. It's a phenomenon known as invisible disability. And it's something that we didn't really address here on this panel, but it was great that you mentioned it, Ted, because a lot of people, you know, they, they might be using a magnification features, but not realize that they're using magnification. You know, especially among the, the elderly, as you said, the other suggestion that I would have in terms of how to help or, or how to be of help is, you know, maybe establish little groups of people. Obviously, you know, the groups of 10 or more are, they're suggesting not to have groups of 10 or more, but, you know, maybe establish a group of friends or something where you, you go and you have a dinner night or something like that. So it, it moves the relationship beyond the realm of helper versus helpy. You know, it's more like, okay, we're just kind of hanging out now. We're just kind of getting some much needed person to person contact. And that's true regardless of whether you choose to play video games, play cards, or just play Netflix all night, you know, because physical contact and, and friendship is camaraderie, I guess, is the best word I would use there. That's a great point. We literally, it was like last night or the night before, we literally did a dinner, like a, a Facebook live dinner party with a couple of friends. So that's a great idea. Uh, I'll also share something just to give other folks ideas. My, I have two neighbors who are ICU nurses and I was so excited because I thought maybe I can actually do something. And, and I asked them if they let me shop for them when things get a little bit worse so that when they're done from a long day, they don't have to. And I had to repeat it a few times till they felt comfortable with it. But I feel like it's something that can help, you know, like, like I'm doing something for them because they're doing so much for us. And don't, don't be shy about, you know, checking around with your neighbors and see what you can do because there's always people that can use help, but it's a two-way street. And with that, I would like to thank all the panelists, including Sherry, even though she had to leave early. Before we wrap up, I would like to do a couple of end notes. One of them is the GAD pledge. So... Last year we did what we're calling the SOAR report, the State of Accessibility Report, where what we're trying to do is GAD, usually Global Accessibility Awareness Day, does really well. Lots of companies talk about it, but we felt that it's really important for it to make a difference. So we created a baseline last year to see how accessible the web was and digital products, and unfortunately the numbers aren't great. So we started this GAD pledge idea last year. Here you can see the URL is diamond.la forward slash GAD pledge. We would like to invite folks to join the GAD pledge and do something 
for making the world more accessible will issue a new report on May 21st, which is Global Accessibility Awareness Day. This way we can all be a part of making the web more accessible. A couple of other notes, we have two more webinars in the next two months coming up. Please mark your, your calendar, April 16th and May 21st, which is Global Accessibility Awareness Day. We may change the topic of the next one and do another one of these panels. It depends how things go with COVID, but do mark the dates. And if you have any questions or would like to follow up with any of the panelists, we have a slide here where you can reach them. I'm Joe at diamond.la. You have ted underscore drake at intuit.com. And then you have two links of Sherry and John on their LinkedIn. And we're gonna share the info as well uh, as a follow-up. So thank you again to all of the panelists and thanks to the attendees. I can't believe how many people have stayed in. We still have 39 attendees. So thank you all for hanging in there and we will see you next month.